Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started in our study this evening, we will uh, have a few moments of silent prayer to give you the opportunity to make sure that you're in fellowship. We'll have, after a few moments of silent prayer, I will then open in prayer. By the way, I talked with uh, uh, George Meisinger today, got a call from him. He sounded good. Uh, it's the second time. We had a, a board meeting the other day via conference call. He sounded good then. He was excited because he had a CT scan today and there was no ad- advance of the cancer, and this continues to be the case. Uh, there hasn't been any advance in the cancer, I think, in about four or five months. No regression, but no advance either. And they think that he's had this for about three years. So this is, the doctors can explain this. He sounded good. He sounded uh, energetic. I haven't heard George sound like this in over a year, so I was, I was real pleased to hear that. So let's uh, bow our heads together and open in prayer. Father, we're indeed very grateful that we can come together as believers to uh, focus upon you this evening, that we still have the freedom in this country to do so, even though there are numerous forces at work within our culture to try to limit Uh, religious speech. It happens in many different uh, arenas of life because the enemy wishes to restrict any overt expression of Christianity to a realm of something that is just completely private. Father, we pray that we might be be courageous enough to take our beliefs into the marketplace, to take a stand and vocalize our views when and if necessary under the right conditions. Father, we pray for our leaders leaders from federal government, state government, local government. We pray that you would give them wisdom. Those who seek to subvert the traditional Judeo-Christian foundation of this country and those who wish to destroy the establishment foundation of law in this country, uh, we pray that um, that they would be blocked from doing so and that you would, uh, you would provide opportunities for people who understand the truth to rise to office and leadership in this country. We continue to, to, to uh, pray for our friends in Ukraine, to pray for uh, Jim and Phyllis as they wrap up their ministry in Brazil and head back to Ukraine. For others who are ministering in Ukraine, we pray for uh, their safe return to the U.S. For those that live there, we pray for their safety and wisdom as they have to face uh, various threats to their country from uh, Russia. And we pray that you would also restrain Putin from uh, any kind of uh, invasion of Ukraine. pray that you guide and direct us in our study this evening. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles to <clears throat> Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and we're closing in on the end of the chapter as we go through a series of commands that all relate to basic core principles in the Christian life. A number of them relate to what we call and have defined as impersonal love or unconditional love. And I know that some people have problems with the term impersonal love. It simply stresses the fact that you don't have to have a personal relationship with the person you're showing love to in order to show love to them. It's not based on a personal relationship. It's based on a mental attitude and a relationship with God. And we're directing it towards other people, uh, whether we know them or not. We're treating them with uh, goodness, kindness, treating them the way that we would want to be treated in the same situation, the same circumstances. And, and even though this is not a section that is uh, giving a development of impersonal love, many of these 
principles that Paul is, or these exhortations that Paul is laying down here, relate to impersonal love. As we come to uh, the passage we're in today, I'm uh, just to <clears throat> focus on verse 17, or a reminder of verse 17, as we keep looking, we're going to look primarily tonight at the principles for peaceful living. Verse 18, Paul, or verse 17, Paul says, Repay no one evil for evil. That is part of impersonal love. Do not react to people. Do not respond in bitterness to bitter statements. Do not respond in anger to angry statements. Do not respond with vindictiveness or vengeance. In other words, seek what is best for them. Have regard uh, for good things in the sight of all men. That is, things that are good, that are generally held to be good by all men. Now, verse 18 if, we covered this last time at the end, if it is possible, this is a first-class condition indicating that it is possible because with God all things are possible. If it is possible, as much as depends on you. There are many circumstances when we can't control how other people respond to us. We can't control what they think. We can't control their opinions. You can't control how they react to you. All you can control is your own actions, your own thoughts, and your own behavior. So as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now, there's a lot of confusion about what the Bible teaches about peace, which is why I want to drill down on this a little bit tonight. And it's important for us to understand that this is a prime directive as part of our Christian life. So the concept of possibility from the word dunitas indicating that which is possible. Sometimes it has the, it, it, the idea of strength or capability. So here it's the idea of possibility. It emphasizes the individual volition, because with God all things are possible. It really depends on us, how we are going to choose to respond to that situation. The main verb is a present active participle that has a, an imperatival a sense to it that we are to live peaceably or to live in peace with all men. The word for men is the word anthropos, which we would could also translate it with all human beings, with all mankind. And so this introduces the idea of how we do this. Now, last time I went back to plug this into the conceptual uh, diagrams that I've used in the past. We haven't used them a lot in some classes lately because we haven't been in an arena to do so, but we are now. And that has to do with what I've called the spiritual skills. And I call them spiritual skills because any anything that we do that becomes a skill is something that we have to practice over and over and over. It may to some degree come naturally But in order to mature that skill, we have to practice it over and over again. And as we implement these spiritual skills, these ten uh, stress busters, what that enables us to do is to grow as Christians. These These ten spiritual skills basically summarize what the Bible teaches about uh, spiritual life. Now, in John, 1 John, John breaks down three levels of of Christian growth, the spiritual child, the spiritual adolescent, and the spiritual adult. And these problem-solving devices or these spiritual skills can be uh, structured according to when they are mastered in the spiritual life. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're a young believer that you're not beginning to learn how to implement more advanced skills. You're, you are, but you're not really going to perfect them or mature them until you become a more mature believer. But w- growth is not, uh, is not static. In other words, we, c- we can lay down a logical flow to how we grow, but we don't grow that way. Life is messy, Growth is messy. We Learning anything follows a dynamic path, and we learn this one day, and we learn that another day, we learn something else another day, 
And sometimes we come to Bible class and we're in a, in, in a section where we're dealing with more advanced doctrine. Other times we're dealing with more basic doctrine. And so somebody who's a brand new believer may come into Bible class and they're learning and studying Hebrews and they're learning some more advanced doctrine. They may not comprehend it as well as others, but they can still uh, take home a lot from those studies. And then... <clears throat> And so they're learning at a more advanced level, and then maybe two or three years later, they're learning at other levels. This is one reason why I don't teach the same thing one night, one class after another, but I break it up and have different studies going is because it hits different areas of life at different times. And if you just stay in one book and go night after night after night in one book, then it reduces everybody to the same structure, and there's too many areas of life that we're all dealing with to limit it to the problems that we might face that Corinthians relates to or that Hebrews relates to or that Revelation relates to. So by looking at different books and different topical studies, it hits people where they're living or you have a greater chance of hitting uh, hitting people where they're living. So in terms of spiritual childhood, these are the basic spiritual skills and we have five of them. Confession of sin, which simply means to admit or acknowledge sin to God the Father. Uh, the second is walking by the Spirit. F- being filled by the Spirit is a passive thing. We are filled by the Spirit. It's a passive imperative. Whereas walking by the Spirit is an active imperative. I try to put these in terms of of uh, terms that are used in, in an active voice because that addresses the volition more directly of the, of the individual believer. We choose to walk by the Spirit. We choose to not walk by the Spirit. Uh, and that is related to the filling of the Spirit, of course, in Ephesians 5.18 and Galatians, uh, Galatians 5.16. Then we have the faith rest drill where we're mixing promises with faith. And then we have grace orientation where we are learning to deal with every issue in life on the basis of God's grace. So God deal, deals with us all the time on the basis of his grace, not on the basis of works. And we le- need to learn to relate everything in our life to God on the basis of grace and not on the basis of works. This is important at this level because if you don't get grace orientation down, it's really hard to develop the the more mature uh, areas of love for God or impersonal love for all mankind. Those are grounded upon grace, and they're grounded upon doctrinal orientation. So without grace orientation and doctrinal orientation, it's real difficult to develop maturity in the Christian life. Doctrinal orientation is when we're aligning our thoughts and our actions to what the Word of God says. And so those three really go together in tandem, the faith rest drill, grace orientation, and doctrinal orientation. Then as we transition from spiritual infancy to spiritual adulthood, we come to understand this thing called our spiritual sense of eternal destiny, that we have an eternal destiny, and we're in a training ground. It's like we're in boot camp. And when we graduate from boot camp, this is what happens in the military. You go to boot camp. When you graduate from boot camp, based on how you performed in boot camp, you get the get various assignments. And the better you do in boot camp, the more options you have. The less well you do, the fewer options you have. And so if you do well, then you can have your pick of better uh, better, uh, uh, better. Uh, options, better opportunities, better job descriptions, better training. And that's what happens in the Christian life, is that we are on a training program to prepare us to rule and reign with Christ in the eternal kingdom. And when we do, I mean in the Messianic kingdom, and when we do, uh, when we are, are promoted from this life, we go to the judgment seat of Christ, and at the judgment seat of Christ we'll be evaluated. And then on the basis of those rewards then our future uh, responsibilities will be determined. So this is really important, and I find that that this is where many people fail in the Christian life, is they start off 
thinking about, they, they just want to learn basic things about the Bible and Christianity. And a lot of people come to Christianity as God, as sort of looking at the Bible and Christ as a, as a Santa Claus that's going to solve their problems. And then when they get out of the problems that they're in and they reach a le- level of stability, they, they begin to coast. And if we're going to grow according to James 1, 2 through 4, we're going to encounter various trials that test our faith. And often this is where people bail out. They just fail when they hit those maturity testings. And so they never quite get beyond this. And they just fade out. You don't see them anymore. Then in spiritual adulthood, we have four skills that we develop. One is personal love for God. This is what motivates us, is the more we learn what God has done for us, the more we respond to his love with love for him. That motivates us. On the basis of understanding his love, we're then able to love others. That's impersonal love for all mankind or unconditional love, and occupation with Christ when we focus on the Lord. So those three work together in tandem. And the result of all of this, and the reason I put this last, is because when I went through the exegesis of James years ago, I realized that when James starts off saying, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, the rest of the epistle is designed to teach us how to do that. Because that's not an easy thing to do. People sometimes flippantly will say, well, you're going through a tough time, but remember to count it all joy. Yes, that's true, but it's not an easy thing to do. This is not an elementary uh, elementary skill. It's a, a more advanced skill because you have to know a, a underst- and understand a lot of reality and a lot of doctrine to have your mental attitude so focused that no matter what you encounter in life, you're able to relax and have joy even when everything that you've hoped for and dreamed for is falling apart around you. So this is more of a linear, logical development of these skills that we develop as we grow to maturity. But just because you've grown to maturity doesn't mean you've fully mastered some of the basic skills. These, it, 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 there's a logical structure here so that the more advanced skills are pr- based on the more basic skills, but that doesn't mean that you learn them one after another. Some people have gotten that misconception that first you learn and master one, then you learn another and master it, and then another and master it. And that's not how life works. That's not uh, dynamic. Now, the next chart I put up here, and this one is one that many of us are familiar with and one that really helps with us uh, understanding and applying a lot of doctrine, is, is this chart on the Christian life, that on the left side, we have our eternal realities, what we have in Christ, which can never, ever be lost. Once we're, at the moment we trust in Christ as Savior, we're immediately identified with his death, burial, and resurrection, which is called the baptism by the Holy Spirit. We're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and, and many, many other things that are ours in Christ. And we're always in Christ and can never lose that position. But on the right-hand side, there are certain temporal realities. Some moments we're walking by means of the Spirit, then five minutes later, we've gotten angry, we're, we chose to act on our anger, we're out of fellowship, and we're operating on the sin nature. And we're out in carnality. And the way to get back is to confess our sins, to admit and acknowledge our sins to God. That's the first problem-solving device. And we're immediately back inside that white circle. We're back in, in fellowship. But fellowship also is a dynamic reality. When you have fellowship, when you're enjoying uh, 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 your relationship with somebody, that's a dynamic relationship. It's not something that's static. And so... That's why I emphasize walking by the Spirit. It's a life. It's a way of living. It's what we, why we call it the Christian way of life. So when we're back in fellowship, we're to stay in fellowship. Too often people get in a in a cycle where they're just going in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, and they're not even making a hamburger. You know, in and out burgers. Y'all wake up a little bit. I could tell we got a slow crowd here tonight. 
They're just going in and out, in and out, and they're never getting back in fellowship. They're, I mean, they're never growing. They're never maturing. And, and they think that that's it, that, that, that that's the sum total of the Christian life is confessing sin. And confession sin is, is like getting in your car with a full tank of gas, and now you have the key and you can go somewhere. But they spend all their time getting out of the car and then getting back in the car, and they may put the key in the ignition, then they get out of the car, and then they get back in the car. They never go anywhere. They're just getting out, out of fellowship and in fellowship. That's all they're doing. But the whole point is to get in the car, start the ignition, and walk or drive by means of the Holy Spirit and go somewhere. So in this diagram... And the reason I'm going through these at the beginning is because we're going to uh, we plug in some of the things that we're learning back to this diagram. These different spiritual skills enable us to stay in that right circle, to stay in fellowship. When we're using these skills, we won't use the human viewpoint skills to solve problems which are related to self-centeredness, the sin nature, anger, all these other things that we may use, and manipulation, uh, whatever it is, in order to make life work. And so <clears throat> I've added this circle to show this is, the, this is how we stay inside that circle. These are the dynamics that keep us in fellowship when we choose to use them. When we choose not to use them, then we're outside of that circle and we're in the realm of carnality and the control of the flesh. So while we're in the circle, that's called abiding in Christ. It's called walking in the light. It's called walking by the Spirit, and it all depends upon our volition. So we have to trust in the Lord and use these all these different things in, in, in application te- as application techniques in order to stay in fellowship. A part of the whole issue related to the challenge in the Christian life related to impersonal love for all mankind is to maintain peace in relationships. And there are some relationships where maintaining peace and harmony in that relationship is very difficult. And it's not our fault. It's the other person's fault. We can't control other people. You can only control what you do And they may choose not to value what you value. They may choose not to want what you want. They may choose another course in life, but you have no control over that. But when they choose those things which are contrary to what you choose, then the result is going to be uh, friction and conflict and difficulty. Now, in a passage that is very very, uh, close to the one we're looking at in, in Romans 12, uh, 18, we find Hebrews twelve fourteen. pursue peace with all people. This is a much more dynamic challenge and command than what we have in uh, Romans uh, twelve eighteen. There, we, it's the, the verb is translated just live peaceably or be at peace. It's, it's, it's not a strong uh, connotation there. Whereas here you have the word pursue, which is the Greek word dioko, a present active imperative, uh, it, not to take away the imperatival sense of the participle in, in Romans uh, twelve eighteen, but here you have a direct imperative that's used, and a present imperative indicates that something that should be a habit. This is something that should always be a dynamic in your life, something you always do something that is the standard operating procedure in the Christian life. And the word dioko has the idea of moving rapidly and decisively toward an objective. It's, it's uh, the, in the military, it's when, when the commander yells, charge. It's a priority, and you're pers- pursuing something aggressively. You're not just waiting for things to happen. Well, we'll work out that relationship later. Well, it, it's true that sometimes you have to wait for the right time because of circumstances beyond your control. But that does. But on our part, as far as it's possible for us, we should make peace in relationships a priority. So the verb dioko has the idea of pursuing something, striving for it, seeking after it, or aspiring to something. It's used in 1 Thessalonians 5.15. A 
parallel passage, very close to the ideas we have in Romans chapter 12. See that no one repays evil for evil is the first clause. That is uh, just another way of saying what Paul says in Romans twelve seventeen: repay uh, no one evil for evil. Same idea. And then he says, but always seek after that which is good for one another. One another always refers to other believers, and for all people it is those outside the body of Christ. So we're to seek after, and that's the same word, to pursue that which is good for all people. So there's a connection here. It's all part of our way in which we uh, apply impersonal love towards other people. The word... Translated peace in Hebrews 12.14 is the noun erene, whereas we had the verb form, the participial form, in Romans 12.18. Uh, 12, it has the idea of peace or tranquility, stability, something that's calm. It's n- Often people think of peace in the Bible uh, that whenever you read peace, it has something to do with the absence of violence, the absence of war. There are a few places, especially in the Old Testament, where the word shalom relates to the concept of a lack of warfare or a lack of violence. But usually the word peace indicates a mental attitude of stability and calm that results in harmonious relationships. And it's focused on something internal. That's the result of that. So... It's also used as the opposite of chaos or disorder or violence. The primary word that it translates, or Rene translates from the uh, Hebrew Old Testament, is shalom. And shalom is another one of those words that just has a huge range of meanings. It can be health, it can be tranquility, it can be prosperity, it can be, be safety or security. And so peace in the New Testament fits, overlaps with that same range of meaning in the Old Testament. Remember, the use of ter- many terms in the New Testament writ- written by uh, men who were uh, first language, their first language was Greek, I mean, excuse me, their first language was Hebrew or Aramaic, that they are using Greek words to communicate uh, Hebrew concepts and Hebrew vocabulary. So it's often important that we go back and understand how these words were originally used in the Old Testament before we lock into a meaning in the New Testament. You don't just look at how it was used in first century Greek. That wasn't the context of their thinking. So it has this idea that emphasizes an absence of strife. And this can be peace in terms of your own mindset, an absence of worry, an absence of anxiety, that's when you have strife in your thinking and you just keep keep worrying about things and you're anxious and you're all tied up in knots and it's difficult to sleep. Uh, and that happens to all of us at times where we get very focused on something. We need to take our focus off of the issue and put it onto Christ. First Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. That was our memory verse yesterday at the Good News Club. And they were tying it back to the story with Joseph and how Joseph's uh, brothers uh, became very jealous of of, uh, Jacob's favoritism towards Joseph, giving him a coat of many colors, and how he always looked at Joseph. And, of course, Joseph sort of exacerbated the situation by telling them about his dreams, which indicated that at some point in the future his brothers would be bowing down to him. And that didn't sit well with his older brothers. And so the, they, they became very jealous of him, and they decided that, that the best way out of this solution, this is how human viewpoint works, you have a problem, well, let's solve the problem, we'll kill him. And then uh, Reuben came along and said, no, 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 we're not going to kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. And, of course, all, this, I just love the whole story of Joseph because when it's all done and Joseph has gone through all of these horrible, horrible things, and he ends up finally as the, the number two in command in Egypt, and his brothers finally come back, and there's a reconciliation because there hasn't been peace with the brothers, and there's a reconciliation, and they're afraid that he's going to repay evil for evil, but instead, because of divine viewpoint, he says, you may have meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He saw the hand of God in what had happened, that even though things happened that were 
Uh, painful for him to go through. He was in prison for several years. He was falsely accused, which is why he was put into prison. His family had rejected him, sold him into slavery. None of these are fun things that you like to uh, reminisce about at Christmas or Thanksgiving or Passover or whenever. You have to recognize that that the only way to have harmony in these relationships is oriented to God. That's what's one of the great principles in the Joseph story, is that the only reason they can have harmony at the end is because there's a recognition, and we'll cover this in the points we cover, there's a recognition on their part, the brother's part, of sin. They recognize where they were wrong, and as a result, there can be a restoration of harmony. But until that happened, that there would still be problems with guilt and other things of that nature. So we're to pursue peace with all people. So how do we do that? How do we live peaceably with all? Well, we have to start with God. In the Christian life, in studying the Scripture, in studying any issue or problem in life, we always have to start with God, or almost always. How do we ground this doctrine in the person, the attributes, the character of God? And so we start by looking at the first point, which is God is identified in the Scripture, both the Hebrew Scriptures of the Old Testament and the uh, Greek Scriptures of the New Testament as the God of peace. And this is a genitive. It's, it could be taken as an attributive genitive, that peace is a characteristic of, job, uh, of God. But I think that it's probably a genitive of source, that peace is a characteristic of God but it only comes from God. True, genuine peace only comes from God. And that that then becomes a foundation. And the peace that comes from God is of a distinct kind. There are a lot of ways we can, we can try to restore harmony in our world, in our relationships. And most of the time it's by ignoring problems, overlooking problems, uh, minimizing problems, Acting as if someone's behavior is uh, really acceptable when it's not acceptable, things of this nature. And this is something just by way of an application that's a tough uh, question, that a tough issue that a lot of Christian families are having to deal with, and that all of a sudden you have a child who comes out of the closet and they are uh, homosexual. And now you have... Uh, something else in your life to test your Christian faith. And how you handle that is going to test your maturity. Because on the one hand, you need to avoid overreacting and being judgmental and hostile. But on the other hand, you don't want to minimize your own beliefs and absolutes. And you have to walk that narrow path between those two opposites. And this is where many Christians fall apart. And this is how many people who look at Christianity uh, misconstrue Christianity because they think that Christians are going to be judgmental on the one hand and that the only solution is to change your values. And so Christians have to learn in an application of impersonal love how to show love to a family member and accept them as an individual without compromising their absolute values. And sometimes when you have a child or a sibling or some other relative that is militant about their behavior, and this could apply to anything from drugs to alcohol to uh, who knows what, that they have to recognize that you have your rules and they have to respect your beliefs just as you, you may show not offend them but show that you respect theirs and not get in their face and uh, argue with them about it all the time and make an issue about it all the time so that you can restore the issue to Christ and the cross. It's always got to be the issue, either for salvation or for forgiveness of sin. And not to let the sin become the issue because the sin is not the issue. We can look at numerous examples in the life of Christ, where he didn't make the sin, the individual sin of the sinner, the issue, the focal point. He made the issue always the grace of God, going back to the character of God. So we have to understand how to do that. And trust me, there are people here who may not be facing it now, but they may face that at some point. There's hardly a person here, I would guess, that doesn't have a situation where 
uh, you're dealing with this in your own family. I know that's, that's true for me. I know it's true for other people. And so we have to always exhibit the grace of God. But you can't, going back to uh, the discussion on um, <clears throat> impersonal love for all mankind, you can't show unconditional love for somebody if you haven't mastered grace orientation. If you can't deal with somebody whose behavior is disagreeable to you and is wrong, uh, you can't deal with them in impersonal love if you can't treat them in grace. So we have to learn how to treat people in grace. Okay, our point is that God is a God of peace. He alone is a source of real peace. And we have numerous passages that describe God as the God of peace. For example, in Judges 6.24, after Gideon has done... um, has recognized the angel of the Lord that has appeared to him and commissioned him to be a judge against them and and to give the the, uh, Israelites victory over the Midianites. He built an altar and called it Yahweh Shalom. The Lord is peace. And the writer then inserts this little editorial comment. See, I don't get too many verses like this to show you. The writer often will tell a story, and then the writer inserts his own little sort of editorial observation uh, that he's communicating to his readers, and he says, to this day, it's still there. You can go buy it over here at Ophir of the Abizrites. You can go by and see the altar for yourself. You can reach out and touch it, because the event that happened isn't just some myth or legend. It's a historical reality. And so often in the Old Testament, you have little uh, comments like this as you read through the text. Romans 15, 33, Paul says, as part of his benediction, Now the God of peace be with you all. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, uh, he says, Be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace. Again, he is the source of love and peace. If you want to know what love is or peace is, you go to God to find out what that is. Philippians 4, 9, may the God of peace be with you. Numerous times, uh, Hebrews thirteen twenty again, now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So peace here is also tied or connected to the death of Christ, which established the new covenant. That's the everlasting covenant mentioned here. And so again, we see that the dealing with sin at the cross is foundational to what created peace between God and man. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. So in all these examples, simply uh, the attribute of peace is God's, but he is the source of peace. And we come to the second point, that it is God... As is the God, the God of peace is the one who blesses those who follow Him with peace. He is the one who blesses us with peace. If we walk with the Lord, if we're obedient, if we stay in fellowship, we walk by the Holy Spirit, then God is going to bless us with peace. That's verbiage that comes out of the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. We come to Galatians 5, uh, 21 and 22. Now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. What's the third one? Peace. That is a production in our life that comes from the Holy Spirit. It's not something that we can manufacture on our own. It is something that is a result of spiritual growth, walking by the Spirit. And then he produces that fruit. So some of the passages that we find in the Old Testament, Psalm 29, 11, The Lord will bless his people with peace. This is in relationship to their internal character, not not an external uh, situation where uh, it's it's being contrasted with war. Leviticus 26.6 is contrasted partially with war, but it's a broader context. It's not just talking about war versus peace. God says, I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. So it's not only dealing with uh, peace in a domestic sense, that there are no external enemies, but there are no internal enemies, but it goes beyond that. There aren't going to be these these sources of problems. And Leviticus 26.6, God is promising that 
If the Jews are, are obedient to God, he's going to make them prosperous in their agriculture. Well, one of the problems is if you've got sheep and goats out in the, uh, out in the field and you have uh, wild animals, ravenous animals, you have lions and, and you have uh, bears and you have wolves, then it's not going to be very peaceful for your flock. But God promised that if you are obedient to the word then God is going to take care of these problems. And the wolves and the lions and the bears are going to disappear. And God also promised under the five cycles of discipline that if Israel became disobedient, that God would bring those ravenous animals back and they would be less protective. Now, you can go to the laboratory all day long and you can work on a computer all day long, create all kinds of models, but you can't find a direct cause-effect or an empirical cause-effect relationship between obeying Torah and the number of ravenous animals in the land. But there's, there are connections, and some connections are even human. It's interesting, the more our country gets immersed in the religion of the environment— and the more we get get uh, all concerned about uh, animals and trying to restore all of the different species, and and I love the outdoors, and I love the fact that that uh, people have reintroduced moose and other animals into places in Colorado that haven't seen them in in many many years. But introducing grizzly bears into places like that, or wolves into pasture lands in Wyoming or Montana, is a totally different issue. Last year, when I was up at Camp Arete, I was driving down the road and went around a hairpin turn, and just as I went around that turn, the brush grew right down to the road. There was a moose that was just stepping out in the road, so we almost had a close encounter. Fortunately, we didn't because they're big, and that would have messed up the car. Um, But you have people who are restoring... And they think it's so wonderful that we have bears and we have grizzly bears and we have wolves. And it's having a tremendous effect on cattle herds and on on sheep and goat flocks up in... uh, up in Wyoming, Montana, places like that. When I was at Preston City, there were a couple of instances. There was was, uh, one lady whose two little kids were out in the backyard playing, and she just brought them into the house, and she went to the kitchen sink and looked outside the window. Yeah, this is your sister-in-law. And she looked outside, and the bear went across the, the backyard. And, uh, and they, if she had been five minutes later, those two little kids would have been out in the backyard when that bear went through. And there was another guy who wasn't far from where I lived, and he went out and heard a commotion, and he was raising rabbits, and there was a bear on the rabbit hutch. And he couldn't do anything about it. You can't go out there and shoot him. You, you have to call the, the uh, animal, uh, animal, whatever they call them, the wildlife officer, whoever. And he comes out. He can't do anything either. He flashed his lights and turned on his siren. And the bear looked at him like he was a nuisance and just kept trying to get to the rabbits. Now, we're from Texas. You know how we would handle it. It's a totally different dynamic down here. But that was the way it was. And in many states, it's that way. But what we're doing is we're putting ourselves in our, quote, wisdom, in the foolishness of human viewpoint. We are reintroducing animals that were removed in the past by people who had a biblical worldview and understood that for you to be prosperous and productive in raising animals, you have to remove the threat of these dangerous animals. So... God will give peace, not just the removal of external enemies or the removal of domestic enemies, but even the removal of threatening animals. Uh, Psalm 119, 165, great peace have those who love your law. This is an internal peace, a mental attitude peace. Uh, Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. This could be enemies of a personal nature or enemies of a national nature. Galatians 6.16, as many as walk according to this rule that Paul has just articulated, peace and mercy be upon them. If you're walking according to the Holy Spirit. Psalm 34.14 states the same principle that we have in, in, the new, in, in our passage and in Hebrews 12, to uh, seek peace and pursue it. 
Romans 14, 19, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify one another. Oh, that's the third point here. God commands us. This is a mandate to pursue peace with all. Other passages, 1 Corinthians seven fifteen. But God has called us to peace. So this is a standard that God expects of us. This is what we are to be identified by. That's the principle in calling us to peace. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. Don't live creating disharmony with other people. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And as I pointed out, this isn't a subjective thing. This is letting the reality of our reconciliation with God, which is also called peace, let the reality of our peace with God control our relationships with other people. Because we are at harmony with God, we need to let that principle be applied in terms of our relations with other people. And then 1 Thess 5.13, be at peace among yourselves. Next point, God describes the new covenant as a covenant of peace. It's called an eternal covenant. It's called the new covenant. It's called the covenant of peace. Isaiah 54.10, God says, Nor shall my covenant of peace be removed. It's an eternal covenant. So once the new covenant is implemented, when Jesus returns and establishes the kingdom, then there will be peace on the earth. That's what this is talking about. Not until then. Uh, Ezekiel 34.25 states, I will make a covenant of peace with them. Notice this again connects it to wild beasts in the land and cause wild beasts to cease from the land and they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I think we can build a whole doctrine of environmentalism, uh, biblical environmentalism, right out of these verses. And it would just rattle the cage. Of course, nobody would pay attention to us because we're basing it on the Bible. Ezekiel 37, 26, again, calls it a covenant of peace, an everlasting covenant. Now, and point five that we I've talked about already, shalom in the Hebrew, irene in the Greek, uh, communicate the same concept. Passages like Judges 6.23, peace be with you, do not fear. So here the context has to do with a mental attitude where peace is contrasted with fear, worry, anxiety. So peace is a mental attitude state. First uh, Samuel 16.5, uh, peaceably, uh, Samuel says, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Notice it's related to sanctification. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Luke twenty four thirty six. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. This is after the resurrection when he shows up with the disciples. And he says, peace to you. This is a greeting. But it recognizes, it's basically saying, may God's peace be present in your life. It's just shortened. Peace with God, point number six. Peace with God is the foundational message of the gospel. It's related to the whole doctrine of reconciliation. We are born at enmity with God. We're born at hostility with God. And at the cross, Jesus Christ removes that certificate of debt so that peace can be restored. We can, we can be reconciled to God, but first because the certificate of debt, the sin, has been taken care of. Now, one of the first places we see this mentioned in the New Testament is in Luke 2.14 with the announcement of the angels. Glory to, the God, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now, if you have a King James Version or New King James Version, that's how it reads. That's what the majority text says. But if you believe in the alternate view that I don't believe is accurate at all, the view that older makes it better, which is not accurate, uh, the Westcott Hort view, then there is an alternate reading there which uh, people get confused about. So if you're using a New American Standard, NIV, or some of these, it reads very differently. It says, peace to men of goodwill. Now the difference is that uh, it's either uh, eudokia as the nominative singular, 
which uh, refers to a state or condition of being kindly disposed, or uh, eudokia as the genitive singular. So you either have the nominative singular of this verb, or you have the genitive singular of the verb, and if it is the nominative singular, then you're saying goodwill to men. If it's the genitive, it's men of goodwill. So in the first case... And I've heard this uh, ridiculed by some people who didn't think it through. The angels are are announcing that the Savior, who was called what? What was what was he called back there in Isaiah nine six? The Prince of Peace. So you have to t- you have to connect the dots in your theology, Old Testament and New Testament. Peace. Because the Savior has come, and it is God's message of goodwill to fallen men, that he's going to provide peace. Whereas the alternative view, that's, that, that's a view that confused some people, which probably explains why the uh, word was changed to a genitive, that God would only send peace to men of goodwill. Now think about this. Put your little theological thinking caps on, if God is sending peace only to men of goodwill, or, is he sending, or was, was peace intended for all mankind? Some of you got it. This is a limited versus unlimited atonement issue. To, if peace is only for men of goodwill, was only intended for men of goodwill, then God has a limited atonement message here that the angels are only announcing that the Savior has come only for a restricted number. But the majority text reading that should read on earth peace, goodwill toward men, God is announcing through the angels that the Savior has come and and the potential is for goodwill to all mankind, for a blessing. That's what Eudokia relates to as blessing, for all men comes through the cross. Just a little added insight there. Point seven. The only basis, therefore, for achieving peace is to understand the dynamics of resolving the most extreme conflict of history, which is the rebellion of man, the creature, against God. This is the doctrine of reconciliation. Man has revolted against God, and God is going to solve the problem and reestablish peace. We are reconciled to God. God isn't reconciled to us. Passages like Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, because we have been justified by faith, we have as a present position, part of our, uh, part of our position in Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a present reality, whether you're in fellowship or out of fellowship, there's a state of peace between the believer and God. Through whom, that is through Jesus Christ also, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Colossians 1, 19 through 22 is another key passage or central passage on reconciliation. Colossians 1.19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, so that he is fully God, and by him, that is by Christ, to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood or through his death of his cross. Now when did that peace was when was that peace accomplished? At the cross. Not when a person believes in Christ. But there is a dimension of it that is accomplished at the cross that mankind is reconciled to God once that sin penalty is paid. That's why sin isn't the issue anymore. The issue is faith in Christ. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. You who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. See, the reconciliation occurred at the cross through the death of Christ. Not when you believed, but it happens when Christ died on the cross, when the sin, sin is paid for. Now we'll see a little bit more about that in the next, in, under the next point. 
Peace with God is accomplished, and we realize it in a present in our present life, only because the sin problem was dealt with at the cross. Because a harmonious relationship legally has been established between the human race and God by Christ's death on the cross, a harmonious relation for, relationship for the individual can be reestablished when the believer puts his faith in, in Christ. So that Colossians uh, 2.13, let's just skip to the second part there, and you being, and that's a participle there, should be understood as a, a concessive participle, although you were dead in your trespasses and sins, or when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, our trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him because he forgave. That's how you would translate it. It's causal participle. Because he forgave you of all trespasses. How did he forgive us of all trespasses? By having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Uh, King James translated, he wiped out the certificate of debt. When did he wipe out the certificate of debt? At the cross or when you believed? A lot of people think it happens when you believe. But that's not what this text says. It says, because he wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken, past tense, he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It happened historically in 33 AD. It doesn't happen when you believe. When you believe, it is applied to you. But it happened that, that rec- act of reconciliation has happened historically at the cross. That is what gives us peace. So this is the basis for how we have peace with, <coughs> with others. Passages like Psalm 133.1, uh, believers should dwell in unity. Romans 12.18, our passage that we're studying, Matthew 22.39, we shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the basis for peace, understanding God's work of reconciliation. So in reconciliation, we see that there are two key, key elements, grace, which solves the sin problem, and love, which is the source of God's gracious acts towards undeserving humanity, as seen in Romans 5. 5, 8, God demonstrated his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What's the context of Romans 5? Reconciliation and peace. That God demonstrated his love so that we could have peace. In Matthew 5, 44, we learn that love, and all of this relates to love, is a volitional act and a mental attitude. We choose to love Others, we set our mind on loving. That's a decision we make. Matthew 5, 44, we are to uh, love our enemies. We have to make that decision. It's not just a sentiment or, or a feeling. Luke six twenty seven and six thirty two, we're commanded to love our enemies and to do good to those who hate us. John thirteen thirty four, it's a new commandment that is given to us that we're to love one another as Christ has loved us. That's how we have peace with one another. And then as we finish, the result of this is that we can have inner peace, inner tranquility, stability, even in the midst of turmoil, even in the midst of chaos in our lives. When we don't know what's going to happen next, we can relax because God is going to keep us in perfect peace. Isaiah 26, 3, which I quote quite a lot, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Other passages, John fourteen twenty seven. Jesus said, My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, because we have the peace of God. All right, next time we'll come back and finish up our chapter in Romans 12 and then get into Romans 13 dealing with uh, submission to government. It's time for politics as we go into our uh, runoff season here in Texas. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things and to be reminded of your love and the real dynamics of love and peace as they come from the cross. Father, we pray that you would just help us to realize how much we need to implement these things in our own lives, that peace only comes when there's honesty, recognition of sin, and a recognition of your solution 
to sin, whether it's a problem of sin in, in terms of salvation or problems of sin in terms of the way it's just disrupted a, a individual relationship. Father, we pray you challenge us with these truths in Christ's name. Amen.